Welcome to another session in this practitioner's course on descriptive, prescriptive and predictive analytics. Uh, we discussed hypothesis uh, testing the concept, the intuition, the trips and the traps uh, around it in the last session. In this session, we will take some examples uh, on how to conduct hypothesis testing in real life scenario. We will also talk about some non-parametric test, another interesting breed of uh, hypothesis tests which have become very important uh, in this era of analytics and uh, computer based uh, decision making or statistical inference. So, let us start with an example. So, we start with comparison of independent samples. So, here we will compare independent samples. Uh, independent samples means that you have taken a sample uh, from uh, the population and you want to compare it with regards to with respect to some population characteristic that you already know. There is also an extension of this test when you take two different samples which are independent of each other and then you want to compare each other. It is almost the same thing. So, let us start with the simplest case. So, you as we said you are the HR manager, you started conducting some tests and then you know that historically in your uh, company the scores have been 580 and the standard deviation was 50. You did some HR initiatives, HR initiatives and after all the HR initiatives that you did the score is now this. Let us assume standard deviation is this. So, you, you, you took say a sample of uh, 20 people and then you found the score is 610. Now, as with any corporate meetings, uh, there are various reasons. Some of the people may say that you know this 610 is just accidental actually the score is still 580, there is not much of a difference. It is just because you happen to choose uh, 20 better guys that the score is coming to look different. If you look at the entire population, the score is uh, not much different. So, this is the challenge that you have and now you want to defend yourself. So, what you do is you do a z score. So, remember the formula was x bar minus mu by sigma by root n. So, you calculate 610 minus 580 by 50 divided by root 20. This comes to be around 2.68. Now, you look at the z table and suppose you want to do a confidence uh, interval of uh, say 99 percent. So, your alpha is equal to 0 0.01. So, what you do is here the c value of that alpha 0 0.01 comes out to be 2.58 if you check. So, because this 2.68, because 2.68 is greater than 2.58. This means for 99 percent of the case actually the mean has changed. So, this, this shows that this is no more an accident assuming that there is a 99 percent confidence interval and your HR initiatives have actually worked. So, congratulations. Let us do uh, another example. In this case, suppose your mu was 15, your sigma was 6. You can take any example, you can frame. For example, um, I took this example from uh, uh, Rand and Wilcox uh, modern statistics for behavioral sciences. 
So, it is it is a huge book with a lot of state of the art techniques. So, a simple example out here. So, here z is equal to 19 minus 15 by 6 by. So, in this case the number of the number of samples was 16. So, you calculate this comes out to be 2.67. So, if you were doing a 95 percent confidence interval, then the z at 95 percent is equal to 1.96, because 2.67 is greater than 1.96. You say yes, the value of my sample is different from the original value of the mean. So, there has been a change. So, this is the comparison for independent tests for independent samples. Now, the issue that comes is that here you know for example, you are taking values of n equal to 16 or n equal to 20. Now, this is still uh, I would say in the border line. Ideally for normal distributions, these values should be much larger probably 50, 100. So, some people say that even 200 or 1000 are the kind of the number of sample values which should be there to actually make the normal distribution assumption work for the sample. In normal cases, uh, this is not possible. You often work with small samples, your sample may be just 5, 6, 10, 15. So, in this case, you use something called a t test, which instead of uh, calculating a t statistic from a normal distribution, it uses its close brother called t distribution or rather students t distribution. Now, this got the name student because the, the fellow Gosset who made this distribution who came with this innovation. Uh, he was uh, working for a brewery company and uh, could not publish in his own name because they were using this uh, statistical method for their competitive advantage to compare improvements in their own brewery process and the owner though supportive of Gosset did not want this trade secret to be leaked out. So, he published under uh, t distribution students uh, t distribution. So, what this student t distribution does is that if this be the normal distribution, then this distribution is slightly fatter and thicker. So, in a way when the sample size is less instead of being as thin as a normal distribution. So, if this be the normal distribution, this is the t distribution. What it does is that it assumes that there are more points which can come in extreme the extremities than the normal distribution. So, in other words, the confidence interval of this distribution is more spread than the normal distribution. So, it is like of a if you can see the curve, it is a more conservative estimate and hence now this value of t distribution actually this is a function of something called degree of freedom. So, as the degree of freedom increases, this tends to normal distribution. So, if for example, degree of freedom is around 40 or 50, then it almost becomes a replica of the normal distribution. But when degree of freedom is less, it is a bit different from the normal distribution. So, what is done is that for small sample sizes, 
the state distribution is used where degree of freedom is equal to n minus 1. So, why n minus 1? Because uh, intuitively I mean the maths part I do not want to get into, but intuitively if uh, you know your mean and you know the number of values that made the mean, then there are n minus 1 values uh, which you can actually play around with the other one the, the one final value has to be fixed because otherwise this it will not sum up to that particular mean. So, what you do in this case is if it is a small sample size you use a t distribution number 2 the sigma of population is unknown. So, use s of sample as proxy. So, one common use of t distribution is when you compare compare two means. So, you have got one sample sample 1 sample 2 here you got n 1 values here you got n 2 values from two different populations you want to compare whether it is the same population or whether the mean is same or not. So, the assumptions are random sampling you assume this group 1 group 1 and group 2 are independent you assume normal distribution for both groups same variance for both groups. So, it actually works if the variance is slightly different, but uh, these are the assumptions. So, here what you do is uh, you calculate a, a combined variance which is given by and then you calculate your t statistic which is given by x 1 bar minus x 2 bar divided by root of and you compare with t distribution table for degree of freedom equal to n 1 plus n 2 minus 2. So, what you do is you calculate this get t if t greater than t then different else not different 
or rather it is difficult to say that it is not different. It is difficult to say that it is different. So, this is the test you create. If you want the R code, uh, I would advise that you know you can uh, you can go to this link. It gives access to a lot of uh, uh, good packages for doing advanced hypothesis testing and other tests uh, on uh, the R platform. So, if you go there, you have a lot of these commands. You just run each of these commands, and then you can install these packages, uh, which can be useful even after you have completed this course. In case of t-test, there is simply a t dot test function. So, this is if you are just testing a one particular uh, sample, this will give you the confidence interval for this particular sample. So, here x, uh, x is your x 1, x 2, x 3, x n. So, this is one if you uh, want to compare with a hypothesized value whether my values are comparable to something then you use the same x you put mu equal to 0 or whatever value mu is the the population mean conf level equal to 0 0.95 so this will this will give you confidence interval this will do the test test for one sample and then if you want to compare then you use t dot test x y So, here x and y are two samples, var equal to true means that you are telling the R code, the telling the R processor that x and y they both come from distributions which have the same variance and the confidence level is 0 0.95. In case this is false, it still works, it uses a Welch method, which is an adjustment made to the test statistic that you calculate for your t distribution. It is an adjustment to that test based upon the research by Dr. Welch. It uses that to do the test statistic. So, this is the R code. So, let us do another example. Now, this is an example I take from Salk 1973. So, here it is an example from the medical domain where they wanted to test whether the mother's heartbeat has any soothing effect on the newborn. Uh, it is an interesting case and if you read I mean you can get into all the details here. Let us get into the numbers quick. So, they had two groups in group 1 n 1 was 20 x 1 bar was 18, the standard deviation was 60.1 in group 2, n 2 was 36, x 2 bar was 52.1, s 2 was 88.4. So, what they did was they calculated as usual, they assumed S1 bar to be the population, the proxy for population standard deviation. So, this I think came out to be 13 and uh, S2 by into this came out to be 15. 
Now, here when they did the calculation, the T came out to be 3.2, the degree of freedom was n 1 plus n 2 minus 2 equal to 56 minus 2 equal to 54. So, if I uh, take the 95 percent confidence interval 40 d o f equal to 54 was 2.01 and hence because 3.2 is greater than 2.01, you concluded that there is difference and this actually led to a huge uh, revolution in uh, mother care and the importance of uh, mother child bonding especially in the, the first phase uh, of uh, childhood. So, a whole whole lot of research came up from this because the, the, the goal was as I said soothing effect of mother's heartbeat on newborn. So, the uh, entire uh, stream of attachment parenting that came from this. Now, if you look at the confidence interval, if you do the calculation again we, we showed you that the confidence interval is nothing but x bar minus whatever your t statistic confidence interval is there into sigma by root n and x plus confidence interval sigma by root n. So, in this case the confidence interval was 25.5 to 114.7. This was the confidence interval on x 1 bar minus x 2 bar the difference. Now, because 0 is not there, no 0 which is positive which means there is clear evidence that there is an impact of mother's heartbeat on newborn. So, similar to what we did here, here the we were comparing two populations which were uh, coming from two independent samples. There are cases where you have the same set of people, person 1, person 2, person 3, person n, it is the same set of people you make observation 1 and observation 2 about the fellow. So, here you get some say 33, 42, 58, 62, 17, 23, so on, 34, 41, 62, 70, 15, 19. The same set of people you observed something initially then you did some treatment, treatment or experiment or whatever. Now, you observe this and you want to compare whether there is a difference between the two or not. In this case, we use something called the, the paired t test. Here, what you do is you calculate difference which is in this case minus 1, 1, minus 4, minus 8, 2, 4. You calculate these differences, you do a d bar you do a and then you calculate your test statistic to be d bar by s d by root n and then you compare your 
this whether it is less than equal to or if you want to reject the hypothesis null hypothesis which is the present condition you test this and this uh, t is t you get by 1 minus alpha by 2 because it is a two tailed recall. If, if you have to reject on both sides with confidence interval of alpha, so this will be alpha by 2, this will be alpha, this will be alpha by 2. So, alpha by 2 plus alpha by 2 is equal to alpha. So, whenever there is a two tailed test, tail 1 and tail 2, two tailed you use alpha by 2. So, you compare this quantile or the confidence interval and degree of freedom is equal to n minus 1 because there are n observations. So, if you want to do in R the same t dot test x minus y or so you just this x and y are your values you which you have defined. The other way of writing is that you like other test we did you simply say x y paired equal to true. Uh, make sure that uh, the the number of items that you have they have to be equal because it is a paired test. Now, there are a lot of hypothesis tests and if you get this broad field there are uh, multiple uh, hypothesis for means, for variance etcetera that you can keep calculating. The concept will always be the same, you calculate a test statistic, you compare with uh, the confidence interval, desired confidence interval. If the test statistic is bigger, you say there is a difference due to my initiative, the alternate hypothesis is true else you say null hypothesis is true. But all of these tests, these are called parametric tests, which means they assume some parameters. Now, these parameters come from an assumed distribution, typically normal distribution. So, what you normally do slightly mathy way is that this is the normal distribution with mu sigma you convert into a normal 0 1 distribution and you compare the parameters of whatever you did with this assuming this normal distribution. You get these t distributions, there is a chi square distribution, there is an f distribution which are nothing but variants of combination of normal distribution. So, you combine these distributions in different way for your desired characteristic. The first assumption is normal, the second assumption is that all the values that you take are independent of each other. Your selection of one value does not bias your selection of other value for the test. So, these in itself actually create few hazards. Number one, life is not normal. Yes, ideally we would like everything to be normal, but uh, things are not always normal, not all distributions are normal. And uh, if you have heard about the central limit theorem, we will just briefly touch upon it. It does say that the irrespective of wherever you take your samples from, the distribution of the sample means assuming that you take large samples is going to be a normal distribution. But then that kind of a sampling is 
something that we do not do. Normally, we just take a few samples and hope that the things are normal. But life often is not normal, especially in fields related to analytics where it is mostly used today. For example, domains of uh, customer analytics, domains of financial analytics. Life is not normal. Most of the cases, the normality does not hold good, but you still go away with the test and that is why the results do not come and then you, uh, you figure out what went wrong, does not simply work out. The, the second obviously, getting independent samples also becomes an issue. In fact, it is a huge issue even in the field of medicines, because what happens when you compare a, a group of diseased versus uh, healthy people? It is difficult to get actually uh, a lot of healthy people and lot of diseased people with the same parameters, all the parameters being together and that, that is why you will see a lot of this conflicting researches keep happening. So, that is where we are constrained. So, independence is another issue, independence getting independent large enough sample is an issue and the third is often it has been the case that you are not actually concerned with the actual value of x x is not important, order of x is important. What I mean by that is suppose you get x 1, x 2, x 3, x 4, x 5 up to say x 100. Suppose I arrange them from in ascending order. So, so far x is always less than x 2, x 3. It is the order, it is wherever it lies in this entire ascending data set, that order is important. So, x 1 being the lowest, it matters that x 1 is the lowest, it matters that x 3 is third lowest, it matters that uh, you are in the 90th percentile. For example, when you give a CAT exam, uh, it does not matter actually how much score you get, but what is important is where do you lie compared to other people. Now, more and more of competition coming up and most of this analytics driven by competitiveness, uh, it is uh, imperative that more than the value, the order becomes important. Also, because sometimes what happens, you change your metric of change, your metric of testing, you change the way you are scoring something. So, the score per se is not important. You are perhaps scoring somebody on a scale of 600. Now, the score has become 1000. So, rather than whether the absolute actual score x 1, what is important is that the order in the entire population where x 1 lies, that is important. So, these are the reasons. Now, what happens is in uh, parametric sample, what happens when you get one wrong sample one bad sample and your test result is skewed. Some outlier value, some values where there were significant measurement errors. So, the distribution does not come out to be normal. So, nowadays with more and more of these computationally uh, our strong computational powers that we have got and more kind of uh, tools we have to do more complex computations. There is a growing interest in something called non-parametric statistics. So, in non-parametric tests, the good part is no distribution is assumed. Mostly these are based on ranks or order. There is a huge uh, debate and uh, I do not want to get into that debate, though I do have a side on this, but there is a debate where that uh, whether these versus parametric
which is more powerful and uh, often you will find surprisingly that these non parametric come out to be very powerful especially when the data that you are getting is ugly or in the era of uh, big data i would call it bad data the reason being that the very fact that you are using big data or huge amount of data it generates a huge amount of noise as well and uh, so far the subjectivity that the what you are assessing are subjective parameters and not very hardcore strongly measurable or calculable uh, parameters this noise actually has a big role and uh, the the real data uh, for analysis is not relevant for you so so you know there is this parlance which says that uh, you you never get either the right amount of data you either get too much of data or too less of data so in these cases where you have to look beyond the noise and look at the order the relevance you know actually non parametrics uh, come out to be uh, very strong and uh, there is a growing interest now earlier it was more of a i would say support to parametric but nowadays it is becoming a domain in itself there is a huge renewed interest so if you are in the field of management hr psychology if you are doing sentiment analysis if you are dealing with fuzzy or dirty analytics for example lot of data coming from marketing analytics so more of i would say the softer sciences this is where your non parametric methods uh, become important so let us quickly go through some of uh, the interesting non parametric tests that we have so one of them is a man whitney u test what you do is you take independent samples you put them in ascending order and so this is a this is a test of comparison of independent samples so this is the analog of uh, the t test that we did so here what you do is you put them in ascending order so this was data set 1 and data set 2 now you want to see that if you merge them and you make a bigger data set maybe slightly bigger and rank order or put them in ascending order does the relative position of each of these values change in this so for example if something was in 10th percentile here does it still almost remain at 10th percentile if it remains then you say that they are basically data from same sample and hence there is not much of a difference but if it is not the case then you reject so what you do is you design a statistic called man whitney u statistic you do it for all
sum of ranks or if you are using r you can simply use this there is another tool called this so you can use this and then you you can do the same analysis there is another popular test called kolmogorov smirnov test and it is used in a lot of applications when you are going to test independence of samples or even data fitting you want to see whether your data actually comes from normal or not so you do you want to compare and see whether it's actually distributed normally or not you use this kolmogorov smirnov test kolmogorov by the way was i would say the father of modern probability so if you are using r it's a simple ks test xy or if you have downloaded some of the earlier packages you can give more parameters and it it is something like this so here what we do is you calculate again i don't want to get into too much of details but for each of the values in each of the data set so calculate these and these fs f2s or f1s these are proportions of observations in group 1 that are less than or equal to x and similarly f2 bar x is the corresponding proportion for group 2 so you can read about it uh, if you want to do it on r as we said that can simply do this if you notice what we are trying to do here is we are not concerned with what the distribution looks like what we do is we rank order the variables the 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 sample values in some way and then we try to look into that pattern of rank ordering and then predict whether the sample is coming from the same distribution or not an advancement of uh, this uh, ks test is something called anderson darling test so anderson darling test is an extension of ks test then there is something called wilcoxon signed rank test this is the analog of paired t test that we discussed in this case if you use this command you will be able to get this test in uh, r thank you very much